Hello everybody. Let's talk about the cerebellar connections. We've already discussed the nuclei of the cerebellum as well as its gross anatomy in two of my previous videos. And today let's see what are the connections of the cerebellum. Before we go to the connections, let's see what are the functions of the cerebellum and how these connections aid in carrying out these functions. So in every textbook, whatever is given, what is given about the functions are mainly four. The cerebellum helps in maintenance of posture. It helps in coordination of motor actions such as walking and posture maintenance. It helps the adjustment of muscle tone as well as it helps in motor learning. But if someone were to ask you to concisely describe cerebellar functions in two functions, you can call them as or you can describe cerebellar functions as timing of a motor activity and progression of one motor activity smoothly into the next one, the subsequent one or the sequential one. That is one muscle group movement to the next. So how does the cerebellum manage to do this so beautifully? Basically, it receives a constant source of information from the cerebral, cerebral cortex as well as from peripheral receptors such as muscle tendon organs, Golgi tendon organs and such. Once it receives this information, it compares because when the cerebral cortex sends in collaterals into the cerebellum, what it is essentially doing is, it is telling the cerebellum that this is what I am planning to do. And the cerebellum compares this, what it has received from the cerebral cortex with the input that is coming in from the periphery to see whether what the body has done is actually what was intended by the cerebral cortex. Once it sees that this has not been done properly, it provides corrections as and when necessary. And it also plans the next sequential movement a fraction of a second early so that one set of movement will progress smoothly into the next set of movements. But what is unique about the cerebellum is that it learns from its mistakes. So if one movement or one cerebral impulse is not strong enough to provide the desired movement, it has a feedback control which allows it to strengthen or decrease the strength of the subsequent impulses so that the desired movement is achieved. So if we want to remember cerebellar afferents, all we have to remind ourselves is that the cerebellum receives information from above and from below. So if we were to classify afferents into two groups such as afferents coming in from the cerebral cortex and afferents coming in from the peripheral receptors, we can get these afferents and these are all of the cerebellar afferents in brief. Cerebral afferents are coming from the cerebrum are mainly three. They are the cerebro-ponto-cerebellar afferents, the cerebro-olivo-cerebellar afferents and the cerebro-reticulo-cerebellar afferents. And from the peripheral receptors, all these receptors send their messages into the spinal cord and the spinal cord sends them up as the anterior spinocerebellar tract, the posterior spinocerebellar tract, the cuneocerebellar tract and relating to balance what we have is the vestibulocerebellar tract. Okay, so let's see each one of them in a little bit of detail. The cerebropontocerebellar fibers start from all parts of the cerebral cortex and they converge onto the pons. From the pons, they reach the cerebellum via the middle cerebellar peduncle. The next set of fibers are the cerebro-olivocerebellar fibers. They too start from all areas of the cerebral cortex, but they basically converge in something called the olivary nucleus, which is located in the medulla and they reach the cerebellum through the inferior cerebellar peduncle. The last one is the cuneo or the, sorry the cerebro reticulo cerebellar fibers. They receive input from basically the frontal and the parietal lobes which converge onto the reticular formation of the brainstem and from the pons and the medulla these reticular formation fibers send in cerebellar inputs via both the middle and the inferior cerebellar peduncles. And such is the pathway used by the cerebro reticulo cerebellar fibers. What are the in in input coming from the peripheral receptors? The anterior spinocerebellar tract starts as central processes from pseudo unipolar neurons located in the dorsal root ganglia. These central processes relay in something called the nucleus dorsalis in the posterior gray horn of the spinal cord. The nucleus dorsalis is also known as the Clark's column. 
Now after relay, the fibers which are given off from the class column form two main tracks. The majority of the fibers cross over to the opposite side and enter the anterior spinocerebellar tract of the opposite side of the spinal cord, while a small minority of fibers continue on the same side in the same sided anterior spinocerebellar tracts. Both these tracts ascend all the way to the brainstem and enter the cerebellum via the superior cerebellar peduncles and they provide information from proprioceptive receptors, joint position receptors, muscle tendon receptors from both the upper limbs and the lower limbs. The next one as the posterior spinous cerebellar tract. It is very similar to the anterior spinous cerebellar tract in many means. It also is formed by the central processes of pseudo-unipolar neurons and dorsal root ganglion. It too relays in the Clark's column, but here the fibers which are starting from the Clark's column do not cross over. They go to the posterior spinocerebellar tract of the same side. They ascend all the way to the brain stem and they enter the cerebellum via the inferior cerebellar peduncle. These provide information from the lower part of the trunk as well as the lower limbs. The cuneus cerebellar tract caters to the upper part of the trunk and the upper limbs and it originates from the cuneate nucleus which you would remember from a section of the medulla if you have, in, which you have studied in brainstem probably. That highlighted region is the cuneate nucleus. The ones in the center are the gracile nuclei. The cuneate nucleus or the sense of the cuneo cerebellar tract, it enters the, med uh, the uh, brain stem and enters the cerebellum via the inferior cerebellar peduncles and it provides information from the upper part of the trunk and the upper limbs. Vestibular cerebellar tract is very special in the sense it starts from our internal ear. Basically, we have organs which are specialized to detect rotatory motion, linear acceleration as well as head position and these organs are the utricle and the saccule as well as the ampullary organs of the semicircular or the membranous labyrinth. These messages are passed along the vestibular cochlear nerve which reaches the vestibular nuclei and from there it enters the cerebellum via the inferior cerebellar peduncles. Now when we talk about cerebellar circuitry, remembering a few simple points makes understanding circuitry very simple. The first of it, these points are all afferents coming into the cerebellum are excitatory because the basic function of the cerebellum is to tone down and modulate the impulses coming into it. So all afferents are excitatory plus whatever afferents enter the cerebellum divide, some of them go directly to the cortex while some of them make their way to the deep cerebellar nuclei. The only exception to this rule for the afferents is the afferents coming in from the vestibular cerebellum. These do not have any contact with any of the deep nuclei, they directly reach the floccular nodular lobe cortex. Now, students have a lot of confusion regarding cerebellar reference, which you know are basically two. But before we go into that, let's revise what we have seen in the previous video. This is a histological section of the cerebellum showing the three layers of the cortex plus a bit of the medulla or the central axis white matter. The cortex consists of an outer molecular layer and an inner granular layer which is very evident here, lots of cells. In between them you can see the basket shaped Purkinje cells which are very large, very prominent. Now the afferents coming into the cerebellum can be mainly two. The first set of afferents climb all the way to the molecular layer. They are very similar to vines climbing up on a tree and hence they are called climbing fibers. The next set of afferents divide and re-divide in the granular layer. They reach and stop there and give out all their synapses and connection in the granular layer itself. And because of their widespread action, these fibers are called mossy fibers. Now the thing is, climbing fibers are all of them olivocerebellar fibers only. All of them start from the olivary nucleus. While all other efferents coming into the cerebellum, whether they are from the cortex, whether they are from the reticular formation, whether they are from the vestibular formation, all of them are mossy fibers. So only those starting with olivo are climbing fibers. Everything else, they are all mossy fibers. Now the next rule, all 
these fibers eventually reach the cortex. All the fibers coming into the cerebellum except those ones given off to the deep nuclei, most of the fibers reach the cortex and all cortical outputs, whatever are coming down from the cortex, all the messages which are the cortex is passing down are all axons of the Purkinje cells. That means Purkinje cells are the only outputs from the cortex, remember only output from the cortex not from the cerebellum and all Purkinje cell outputs are inhibitory. Now let's see how the mossy and the climbing fibers individually contact the Purkinje cells. The mossy fibers reach only till the granular layer. The cells in the granular layer are the Golgi and the granule cells. So the mossy fibers form synapses with the Golgi and granule cells. These two cells send axons into the molecular layer which eventually synapse with the dendrites of the Purkinje cell. So that is pretty straightforward. When it comes to climbing fiber, they follow three routes. The first route is they climb all the way to the molecular layer, most of them do, all of them do actually and they synapse with stellate and basket cells which are the cells of the molecular layer. These stellate and basket cells send down their axons which then contact the Purkinje cells. The climbing cells can directly some of them contact the or form synapses with the Purkinje cell. And lastly, the climbing fibers on their way to the molecular layer send collaterals while they are passing through the granular layer. These collaterals stimulate Golgi and granule cells which in turn stimulate the Purkinje cells. Now before we go into the classification or the circuitry in detail, let's revise what we have already seen in one of our previous videos. We functionally classified the cerebellum in the last video in cerebellum 2 into three vertical zones. The central zone is called the median zone or the vermal zone given here in red. On either side of the vermal zone what we have is the paravermal zone or intermediate zone and lateral to that what we have is the hemispherical zone or the lateral zone. Now we also describe this functional classification as a classification based on efferent connections. So what is meant by that? What is meant is we already know all efferents coming from the cortex are axons of Purkinje cells. What is meant by classification based on efferent connections is that the Purkinje cells of the vermal zone, they send out their efferents. All of them, all the efferents of all the Purkinje cells coming from the vermal zone form connections with fastigial nucleus only, with the fastigial nucleus only. Similarly, all the Purkinje cells in the paravermal zones send their axons which synapse in the nucleus interpositus only. If you remember the nucleus interpositus is the combined globose and emboliform nucleus. And now I think you've got the idea. All the Purkinje cells in the hemispherical or lateral zone add, send their axons down to the dentate nucleus only. Alright, so I hope that is clear. Now let's see the efferent circuits. The first circuit we will be seeing is the vestibulocerebellar circuit which starts from this part of the cerebellum which is the flocculonodular lobe. Now basically it receives its efferent from the vestibular nerve which reaches the vestibular nucleus and from the vestibular nucleus of the brain stem behind the pons and the medulla what happens is the vestibulocerebellar connection starts and reaches directly the cortex or the flocculonodular lobe. As we said, the vestibular cerebellar connections are the only exception where there is no contact with the deep nuclei. So all the fibers of the vestibular cerebellar tract pass directly into the cortex of the flocculonodular lobe where they synapse with the Purkinje cells of the cortex. The axons of the Purkinje cells in the flocculonodular lobe sent out the efferents which then reach the vestibular cochlear nucleus, vestibular nucleus and from there it passes down into the spinal cord. But some of them may form a circuitous route, a mild variety of fibers may reach the fastigial nucleus also. It's a small percentage of fibers. They then also eventually reach the vestibular nucleus. All the outputs from the vestibular nucleus then become the vestibulospinal tract and these are the ones which help in maintenance of the equilibrium, balance, posture, eye contact. All of them are carried out by the vestibulocerebellar circuit. The second circuit that we will be seeing is the spinocerebellum and the spinocerebellar circuit. And the spinocerebellum is related to the vermis 
and the paravermal zones. So that are those are the vermis and the paravermal zones and the nuclei related to the vermis and the paravermal zones are the nucleus interpositus which is globose plus emboliform here as well as the nucleus fastigius or the roof nucleus. Now what are the efferents coming into this circuit? The spinocerebellum or the vermis and the paravermal area receive efferents from all these tracts, the ventral, dorsal and the cuneospinocerebellar tracts, the trigeminocerebellar tract, the tectocerebellar tract and the spino olivocerebellar. Now take a guess which are mossy and which are climbing fibers. You would have guessed that the spino olivocerebellar has the word olivo in it so obviously that is climbing and all the remaining are all mossy fibers. So there you have your mossy fibers they reach only till the granular layer of the vermal and the paravermal zones. The climbing fibers, the spino olivocerebellar reach till the molecular layer of the vermal and the paravermal zones. Now what are the outputs from here? Once those fibers reach the and stimulate the Purkinje cells of these two areas of the cerebellum, the Purkinje cell sends out its axons. From the paravermal zone what we get are axons of the Purkinje cells going into the nucleus interpositus and from there the nucleus interpositus reaches the ventrolateral nucleus of the thalamus which then continues into the primary motor cortex. These cerebellar fibers modulate the impulses sent down from the primary motor cortex via the corticospinal, corticonuclear and reticulospinal tracts. Some of those fibers also reach the central reticular nucleus and they continue down as the reticulospinal tract again directly via the reticular nucleus. Now the inputs which have reached the vermal part are stimulating the Purkinje cells of the vermal part. These Purkinje cells send out axons which eventually reach the fastigial nucleus because that is the nucleus associated with the vermal part of the cerebellum. The fastigial nucleus obviously can only form a contact with the vestibular nucleus that is its connection and the vestibular nucleus continues as vestibulospinal tracts. And all these tracts are interconnected and help in the posturing of the body, muscle tone of the body. The last circuit which is the cerebro or the pontocerebellar circuit involves the lateral zones of the cerebellum and the nucleus related to the circuit is the dentate nucleus. Now what are the inputs? Inputs are fairly simple. The cortico-pontocerebellar tract, there is no olivo in it so obviously it is a mossy fiber. The cortico-olivocerebellar tract which I am sure by now you are all experts, those are climbing fibers. They send their efferents into the lateral zones stimulate the Purkinje cells of the lateral zones, those Purkinje cells send down the axons into the, that's right, into the dentate nucleus. From the dentate nucleus, we have fibers going up to obviously the ventrolateral nucleus of the thalamus which is needed to stimulate and modulate this impulses coming down from the primary motor cortex as corticospinal, corticonuclear and reticulospinal tracts. Here you have an extra tract which is going to the red nucleus which then comes down as the rubrospinal tract and that forms the dentato rubro thalamo cortical fibers which is a favorite question of examiners. Now how do we compress this information from an exam point of view? Let us see. What the examiner needs is how you can list the fibers in each peduncle. So thinking of the inferior cerebellar peduncle, we can classify fibers coming into the cerebellum via that peduncle and fibers coming out via the peduncle. So the afferent fibers are mainly five, the dorsal or posterior spinal cerebellar tract, the olivocerebellar fibers which are the climbing fibers, vestibular cerebellar fibers, trigeminal cerebellar fibers, okay, sorry, four. And the efferent fibers coming in through the inferior cerebellar peduncle are the cerebellar olivary, the cerebellar vestibular, the cerebellar reticular fibers, cerebellar spinal and cerebellar nuclear fibers. About the middle cerebellar peduncle, it's very simple. It only has afferent fibers and the only afferent fibers entering it are the pontocerebellar fibers which are coming down from the cerebral cortex. In the superior cerebellar peduncle, afferent and efferent fibers, we have the afferent fibers which are the ventrospinocerebellar tract or the anterior spinocerebellar tract, 
tectocerebellar, ruprocerebellar, trigeminocerebellar and the hypothalamocerebellar plus cerulocerebellar fibers. These are minor fibers coming in from the superior cerebellar peduncle. Efference, what are the difference? Obviously, they are the ones going up. So, you have dentito rubro thalamocortical fibers, cerebellar thalamocortical fibers without involvement of the dentate nucleus, cerebellar reticular fibers, cerebellar olivary fibers, and cerebellar nuclear fibers to multiple cranial nerve nuclei in the brainstem. So, this is in short about the cerebellar circuitry and the cerebellar connections. I hope to put in one more video where we'll discuss all of these together in less than 10 minutes plus applied anatomy and an exam outlook. So till then, see you. Thank you.